You can't be saved by circumcision. You can't be saved by the rituals of our forefathers. We're under a new covenant now. So we say to the contemporary world, you can't be saved through Krishna. You can't be saved through Allah. You can't be saved by Buddha. You can't be saved by any of those other pretenders. Only through Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Voice of Triumph with Roger R. Woodard, Senior Pastor of Family Worship Center located in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Pastor Woodard's ministry is reaching a hurting world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Now, from Kings Mountain, North Carolina, here is Pastor Roger R. Woodard. Acts chapter 4. A scripture most are familiar with. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. We are not far removed from the birth of the infant church. Started with a bang, (laughs) with Pentecost. And it has, no matter what anybody tells you, that Pentecostal wave has never ended. True, there have been times in different centuries where it waned, but there's never been a time with the power of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, and the signs and wonders and manifestations have not been active in our world because Jesus said when he, the Spirit of truth, would come, he would abide or remain with us forever. And we are a part today of what we are experiencing of that initial Pentecostal wave that started 2,000 years ago in an upper room in Jerusalem, but it didn't stay in the upper room. They went out on the streets, 3,000 got saved. A Few days later, 5,000 were saved. And the Sanhedrin had to admit before Peter and John that you filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. Even some of the priests were coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles are standing before the same characters who had presided over the illegal trial of Jesus Christ just a few days earlier, John 18, 13, and 14. That was an illegal trial, and those people who thought they were disposing of Christ are now having to deal with a bigger problem. They were grieved, verse 2, chapter 4 said. Why were they grieved? They were grieved at what they were teaching. They were teaching Jesus Christ raised from the dead because they thought they were over and done with, with this Christ. They had done, (laughs) I love it. They had done away with him dealing with one man they thought. And they thought if they could do away with that one man, this little cult was gonna die out. Now they're dealing with thousands because Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do and greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. He went to the Father. Pentecost is proof positive that he arrived there because he said, if I go there, I'll send back the Holy Ghost and it would be proven of two things. One, that he got to heaven. Two, that he was ruling and reigning. Three, that he was coming again for a blood-bought, spirit-filled church. And they were moving in this power. And now these people who had conspired to get rid of Christ and thought that if they could just do away with this one man, they could do away with the whole thing. And they didn't know what to do. And now they're grieved. Threatenings, beatings, 
threatening with death, intimidation, nothing deterred them. They were determined. Nothing intimidated them. They began to get worried. You could check that in Acts 5, 24. They didn't know where this would grow. They said, we don't know what this is going to, what's going to come of this because we can't intimidate them into silence. What they did notice was they had been with Jesus. And I was reading, this came out of my private devotion this week, and it just dawned on me as I stopped, never had thought about it really before. What did they notice about him? Well, the first thing that's in this verse is they noticed their boldness. Well, now this is a change. These are the same people that the night Jesus was betrayed turned and ran away. These were the same one, Peter and John, however, were known to the high priest. And, and Peter is the one that denied three times and even cursed to, make it, to give evidence that he did not know Christ. The Bible says that after his burial and even after the resurrection, they were in a room locked behind closed doors for fear. Trembling with fear, retiring and intimidated, they now were, didn't know what to do themselves. They took note of the fact that these cowardly men, and before you, you, you get some kind of uh, pejorative toward them, you and I wouldn't have been any more courageous, so don't think that we would have. There was a lot to be afraid of. But when Jesus appeared to them and said, now look, I want you to go and tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued or clothed with power. 120 obeyed. And out of that 120 were the 11 who later they chose another one to be the 12 and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And instead of running away, verse 7, when they were asked, notice, by what power or by what name are you doing these things? Now, they had a chance to equivocate right there. But instead of that, they pointed their finger. These are not the same retiring preachers now. They pointed their finger and they said, by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. They didn't back away from pinning the responsibility right where it belonged. You crucified him. His blood is on your hands. And by that Name the stone that you rejected. He's become the head of the corner and by his name and power in his name has brought about this wholeness in this man you see here today. You see, they noted also that they were unschooled. When it says ignorant, it's a, a bit of a poor translation. Ignorant as far as they were not formally trained in the law. They were not schooled as teachers of the law, but they had great knowledge. How did they have this great knowledge? Well, you find it if you look in Luke 24, verses 44 through 47, where Luke records that after his resurrection, Jesus taught them. He spent some time with them and taught them the things that were in the Psalms and Moses and the prophets concerning him. So when they went out to preach and teach in his name, they would refer back to the scriptures that the Hebrews knew. They weren't just out preaching out of the air. They were well versed in what they were speaking about. And so they're, they're preaching. And far from stopping them, Acts 5:28. The Sanhedrin said, do you intend to bring this man's blood on us? They were making things kind of hot for the Sanhedrin. It ought to have been the other way around. They put them in jail, couldn't keep them there. The angel of the Lord delivered them, wanted them to preach this, and so they went, and they went on about preaching. And so here we go. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5 and read beginning in verse number 27. They locked them up, and now the angels had delivered them. They went right back into the temple area, began to teach and preach. <clears throat> and they went, and the captain and the officers brought them with, without violence. Notice, they're now they're nervous. They didn't try to rough them up in front of the people. We're going to take them as gently as they can, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. 
And when they got them in their presence and they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked him, saying, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Peter doesn't blink. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers, let me just say this. If the court or the governor or the president or the house or anybody else says you can't take Jesus in the public forum, we're going to take him anyway. We ought to obey God rather than men. We're not here to go along and get along. We're not here to be popular. We're not here to be liked. We're here to be witnesses, to stand in the name of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. He redeemed us from the law of sin and death, and he's given us an inheritance among the redeemed. Therefore, we are to stand boldly in his name. You mean preacher. You actually believe that Bible from generation to revolution, I believe it. From the concordance, as my old buddy Doug Allen says, to the maps. I don't believe it contains the Word of God, which is what some of the liberal theologians, well, it contains, and would you see how much they really think it contains? You, you could almost have you a, a case of deal with it. It is the Word of God. It is the revealed truth to all men and women of all generations, all cultures, all geography, for now and for all time. It is the one and only voice that will liberate the bound, liberate the one who is addicted, liberate the one who's wrapped up in sin and set them free. Let them lift up their head again, look the world in the eye because they are redeemed and forgiven. And so here, notice there's not that much difference in our society now. I'm sure those of you who paid attention, those of you who don't want to know, you didn't see it. But just this week, the Satanist erected a statue of a, a goat head with horns and satanic symbol and, and their sayings in front of the state house of Arkansas. And uh, it raised some eyebrows, but didn't, not nearly as much as it should have. And there are places on the Washington Monument where the monument where the Temple of Baal is. And there's places in, uh, in New York City where other idol gods have their monuments to the there. And, and where's the outcry from the people of God? Oh, no, we don't, we don't want to rock the boat. Now, devil, if you'll just leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. There's a real problem with that philosophy. He ain't going to leave you alone. You might as well make up your mind that you're going to get armed with the Holy Ghost and the Word of God and a holy boldness and take the fight to him. Put him on defense. Oh, y'all y'all ain't having me none this morning. I said, all right, I'm going to preach. If I don't get an amen, I'm going to preach. We're in this societal mentality where any belief is okay except Jesus. You can believe in the new age. You can believe in Baal. You can believe in Krishna, Allah. And the Muslims want to do jihad, jihad, jihad. Any kind of God or no God is acceptable, but Jesus. You guys go preach all you want to, don't preach in this name. Just have all the teaching sessions you want, just don't teach in this name. Some of you have found that in the school and in your workplace. Just don't tell us about Jesus. We don't want to hear about your religion. 
Keep a reading. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew. You did it. And you hanged him on a tree. But understand this. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be the prince and savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are his witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him when they heard that they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Understand something. That same spirit of murder is in our land today. And there is a sizable amount of evil-minded people who would kill you in a heartbeat if the law didn't prevent them thinking that they're doing God's service. Let me run by that again. There is a spirit of murder in our land. And I know that people read the Bible and its prophecies and what God says is coming to us and dismiss it as though it's far down the road and another generation and we won't have to worry about it. It is upon us. It is upon us. And when you heard that, they were cut to the heart. You don't know why you have such a hard time among your pagan work colleagues and your family members who don't serve God. Your Jesus convicts them of their sin. Whether you open your mouth or not, if you live a righteous life and they see your righteous living, they are convicted in their heart. They want to destroy you, your witness, by offering you all manner of ways to compromise away your integrity with God. I'm enjoying preaching. To compromise away your integrity with God and get you to be like them. And one of the tragedies of the church world today is that truthfully, there is very little difference in the way some church people live and the way the world lives. And it's a tragedy because we compromise our witness. We need to be as resolute as Peter was when he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey, obey God whether whatever you say. You know, in doing my friend's memorial service today, this past week, it was more of a celebration than a, a funeral. But I'll tell you what it does, and it does almost every time. Every one of you probably know what I'm about to say is true. It forces you to deal with your own mortality. It forces you to deal with how precious the gift of life is and how quickly it can be taken from you and over. And then you could pray and have services and light candles and count beads and and go through all kind of rituals, but when death claims, as far as this life, it's done. And what are we going to say when we stand before God? What have we done with this investment of life that he's given us? Do we have any fruit with which we can meet him or will we have to say, as the man given the one talent that Jesus tells us about, I was afraid. And I hid the talent. And the master wasn't pleased with that. He would have been more pleased with that servant had he made the effort and failed than had he succeeded in doing nothing. And I'll just throw this in because it's not in the moment. No, what are you doing with the investment God has made in you? He invested in you and me the death of his son and the seal of the Holy Spirit and everyone under the sound of my voice has a talent and an ability. God expects a return on that investment because we're all going to stand before God one day and that's when it's really going to matter. Don't you speak anymore in this name? Any other name, any other religion, that's okay. And what were they teaching 
and preaching. Well, Acts 4.10 tells you the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people want to accept that he died. And some want to accept that he was buried and stop right there. But if the story stopped there, we would have all be of all men most miserable. If it stopped there, we would just be a group of people who belong to a religion. But the story doesn't end there. He rose on the third day, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And today is at the right hand of the Father as our intercessor. And he's coming again in the clouds of glory. King of kings, Lord of lords, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. That's the message we preach. Not just a historical Jesus. Not just a religious figure that made a deep impression on our world, but the one and only potentate, the high and lifted up high priest, creator of everything that is. But that wasn't all. They threw in verse 12. Just so you know, religious leaders, just so you know, religious people, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Woo! That cut them to the heart. You can't be saved by observing the law of Moses. You can't be saved by circumcision. You can't be saved by the rituals of our forefathers. We're under a new covenant now. So we say to the contemporary world, you can't be saved through Krishna. You can't be saved through Allah. You can't be saved by Buddha. You can't be saved by any of those other pretenders. Only through Jesus Christ. Preacher, you're narrow-minded. Yes, I am. Very. And I'm not saying it be ugly or mean or insult people of other belief systems. I'm just telling you, there's only one way. And that's what they were preaching, and that's what these people did. They didn't care how much else they preached. Don't preach this Jesus exclusivity. That's what the broad-minded people of our day say. I remember when the Brownsville Revival was roaring. Joel Osteen was on uh, Larry King, and Larry King asked him point blank about the Jews and other people who didn't accept Jesus, and he him hauled around and wouldn't answer the question. And sadly, Billy Graham did the same thing. I was in Europe when I saw that show, and Billy dodged it too. He didn't want to be judgmental. But they interviewed John Kilpatrick from the Brownsville Revival. On, on 2020, I believe it was, it might have been Nightline, the, the commentator asking that same question. He didn't bat an eye. What's going to happen to these people? He said, they're lost. So I said, what about Mother Teresa? If she didn't accept Jesus, no matter all the good things she did, she's lost. What about the Pope? He in the same boat. I am the way. John 14, 6. I am the truth. I am the life. Listen, listen, listen carefully. No man comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus was either the greatest fraud ever perpetrated, uh, perpetrated uh, yeah, I can't even say the word, on humanity. He was either a liar and a sick man, a deceiver, or he was who he said he was, the one true way to God. And this world doesn't want to hear it. It's true. If you've got cancer and you don't want to hear the word, and the doctor says, okay, here's a bottle of iodine. Go put it on your cancer. And that mollifies your conscience until you choke and the life goes out of you. 
We have to tell people the truth. If the bridge is out, you can't tell people that the bridge is not out. And they may hate you for it because that's the way I want it to go. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just the atmosphere we find ourselves in. We don't have to tell them like we're glad that they're going to hell, but we have to make them aware that the only way to escape hell is through Jesus Christ. Now, if they choose not to serve him, that's their business. I don't want to put your head on a chopping block with a, with a sword and say you're going to serve God or not. I don't want to coerce you. I don't want to use the law. I just want to have the freedom to tell you that Jesus is the only way and that you take your fate into your hands. And that's what they didn't want to hear. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Well, what was the evidence? I'm trying to land this plane. What was the evidence of the truth of what they preached? A healed lame man standing at their side. Forty years lame. Running, leaping, praising God. And they looked at that man, probably had walked by him a few times in his life. And they said, a notable miracle has been done. And we can't deny it. The evidence of what we preach is the healed, lame men and women that we can produce whose lives were broken but they are healed today through Jesus Christ. So I just wonder, are there any healed lame people in the house? You were bound by drugs, you're free from drugs. You were bound by alcohol, you're free from alcohol. You were bound by promiscuity, you're free from that. Are there any healed people. You're bound by jealousy and anger and unforgiveness. Today you're free. Are there any free people in the house? You are healed. Stand to your feet as a testimony that you Thank you for joining us today for Voice of Triumph. We invite you to check out our website at www.familyworship.org. There you will find information on our church service time, special events, purchase our books and music, and also information on becoming a partner as we continue to take the life-changing message of Jesus Christ to a hurting world. If you'd like to write us concerning our program, our address is The Voice of Triumph, P.O. Box 396, Kings Mountain, 28086, USA. On behalf of Pastor Woodard and the entire Family Worship Center team, God bless you and we'll see you next week.